Hi, everyone. I am Leslie Carvalho, parent to Roman Carvalho, who is six years old and had a left MCA stroke during birth. Um, so again, my, my journey of parenting for six years and learning about living and recovering from a stroke. Um, Roman was diagnosed at age four with ADHD, which very typical, um, and just really trying to find our way and I guess get him better, a better ability to access the language to express how he is feeling and or challenged in processing any of the, you know, the language that's spoken around him. I have come to know this probably in the most intimate way, I would say in the last few months that we've been home, um, homeschooling and it's definitely taken on a different life at the age of six now that he's more verbal and more challenged at school. Um, and there's obviously a layer of being challenged learning remotely, but I think in the last few months, it's, it's definitely opened my eyes to the challenge for him in processing what's being asked of him in a school environment. And prior to that, you know, in a, in a friend um, play environment in the park or um, you know, if there was a, a play date prior to COVID, but the challenges all lead themselves back to Roman's ability to understand what's being asked of him, the auditory processing delay that leaves him sort of in a silent state and then a state of frustration and a state of anxiety. So there's an increase in anxiety around most, most any situation and where it's obvious that there's the delay. And from there he shuts down and it becomes very difficult to navigate his behavior, bring him back from shutting down. Um, it's obviously disruptive in the school environment. It's disruptive in a play environment um, because there's often a feeling of quitting or you know wanting to just to step away and his attention to something else that's more comforting to him, which often is video or TV. Um, so again, another classic example of, of ADHD behaviors and what they crave. Um, but I, in, in watching this happen, probably in the last few months, have been even more challenged with my access to the right language to help him figure out how to manage his feelings and frustrations and truly what it feels like to experience that delay and not be able to process what, what is being asked of him and also the stressors around him. So there's remote learning and there's the feeling that everyone is sort of keeping up and the other classmates are following along and he feels extremely different than that because he's just not able to. And I think that only heightens the stress and anxiety around the experience. And I think it also can happen in a play environment as well. He just senses the differences, but he too doesn't have necessarily the language to access. And, and I, as a parent, trying to navigate what these experiences, which are obviously daily and um, become more challenging as I think they get older, if they don't, I don't have the right language and how to help him navigate through these feelings and emotions around auditory processing and ADHD. And I, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest call outs and struggles. And it's probably the biggest focus in our life right now. Um, and I, you know, I think I've painted uh, hopefully a good enough example of, of what, what the challenge is and truly, because we can't see it from from our own eyes, we don't have sort of the image of what's happening in his brain. And, you know, we, it's, it's hard to understand what, what is happening in the, in those moments. And I, and I also would want the language to help other people understand that this, this is what makes Roman different and different is amazing, but the differences are such in that he, 
is challenged daily and, you know, in daily different situations. It doesn't have to be school focused. Like I said, it can be play focused. It can be, you know, if he's oppositional and when he's oppositional, his attention takes him immediately somewhere else. And it's about as adults or caregivers or parents, um, teachers, how to access the right language to, to help him and to, you know, to get him to the next step so he's not shutting down so quickly. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for, for sharing your experience. Um, I'm uh, Patty Mussolino. For those of you that don't know me and haven't met me, I'm the director of the Pediatric Stroke Clinic at MGH. And we have part of our team in the clinic, Dr. Wisher is on the call. He's a rehab uh, specialist uh, in our group. And I've been working with the parents, uh, a group of parents in, in the Massachusetts, New Hampshire, like uh, Eastern <laughs> US, uh, coast uh, in really understanding how can we address these needs. So what we attempt to do today is uh, go from this experience that you're hearing and you have your own and, and the brain a stroke, uh, it could be very different, the injury to the brain of the kid in each of them. But as Leslie was saying, different uh, is wonderful, but it needs to be understood uh, so we can help them achieve their maximum uh, life potential and, and happiness, like, and how to navigate the world. So I'm going to pass it to Ellen. Uh, Ellen Bratton is uh, uh, also a colleague here at MGH. It happened to be referred to us by one of the parents that met her during a talk in the school about speed processing, uh, processing speed. And uh, Ellen has been dedicating her career to really understanding how the brain works uh, and how this particular aspect of brain function, the processing speed, uh, affects uh, the development of the child and, and all the functions in the brain. So Ellen, without much more introduction, I'm gonna pass it on to you um, so you can navigate us through this complicated <laughs> part of brain function. Thank you so much, Patty. And Leslie, thank you for a perfect example of uh, the prototypical child, not that there really is a prototypical child, but the sort of things that you described are things that I do want to talk about. And what I'd like to do first is to just share some slides with you. And let me see if I can share my screen here in the way that I would like to. And I would love to take your questions at the end. I'd like to just uh, make sure that we all know what we're talking about when we're talking about processing speed and uh, let me just start this and okay. So um, like Patty was saying, I really have devoted the last 10 to 15 years of my research to something called processing speed. And to give you a, an idea of where I started in this, I was at first a um, ADHD researcher. And so I was very interested in attention and inattention and hyperactivity. But I kept finding, as I, and I've been doing this for 25 years now, I kept finding there was this group of children who had difficulties in processing information quickly. And often what you would see on their profile was a slow processing speed index on the WISC, among other things. That's not the only thing that I would be looking at. But oftentimes they were kids who had very slow processing speed on the WISC. And I found that they weren't all ADHD kids. A lot of times they had an organic kind of issue like a stroke. Uh, sometimes they had a learning disability like dyslexia. Sometimes they were on the autism spectrum, but this processing speed issue seemed to be something that tripped kids up regardless of their diagnosis in sort of similar ways. And I became very interested in, in who are these kids and, and why is it that this kind of issue is so significant for them? And I think part of my interest in this topic was because our world got really fast, really quickly. And so what might have been just sort of a normal kind of issue, and even some of the things that Leslie was talking about with Roman, that you know it, his sort of inability to kind of get things done quickly might not have been as much of an issue 30 years ago. It's a big issue now because our world has changed. So I think there are two things. One is I, I, got, I became interested in this topic at just sort of the right time in our history as things were getting much more complicated and much, much quicker. 
So this is a question that has, has um, I, that I've pursued for the last number of years. And this is the sort of question that I would get a lot of times from parents. I would present, you know, I'm, I, and I should say too, I'm a neuropsychologist. That's my area of clinical specialty. And that I test kids and I look at their cognitive development, their language and their motor skills to kind of look at what they need, especially within the school and home environments. And so I would get this question a lot from parents because I would say your child has a lot of great skills and, you know, sometimes I'd even say they're, they're, your child is very smart and they're like, well, if he's so smart, if he's so good at everything, why is he so slow at getting everything done? And it's a perfect question. And the sorts of things that, that they would be complaining about when they would say he's so slow are things like this. He can't get started on homework or it takes forever to get things done. And not just little things, not just homework, but also what do you want for breakfast this morning? And then parents would be like, or I mean, the child would be like, um, and you know, parents say, it's either it's either Cocoa Puffs or Fruit Loops. That's all you have. It's just one, two, one, <laughs> one decision. Just make up your mind and be like, oh, but it's these small things. It's not just the big things. It's also the small things. Sometimes they'd even be kids who had slared off into space. Sometimes kids with slower processing speed would be referred by a neurologist because they would think that, you know, maybe there's a, a seizure disorder here that we just can't pick up on the tests that we're doing. But there's, you know, often things are like staring off into space or even just looking really confused. And Leslie talked a little bit about that. But there's, you know, sometimes there's that sort of, I forget how you said that, silent state, I think is how you, you described it. And that's a very common that, that these children, and in school particularly, teachers think that they don't care, you know, they're not trying hard enough, when really they are trying as hard as they possibly can to understand what's going on. And then the other thing that I oftentimes hear, is my child just lazy? And the answer to that is no. But it feels like that. As a parent, it really feels like the child is just like, just pick up the pencil and do something. Just make up your mind. Just put on your boots, whatever it is. It feels like laziness. And that's why it can be so difficult emotionally to be the parent of a child with this kind of issue. So what are we talking about, though, when we're talking about processing speed? Those are the sorts of common behaviors that I hear. But when we're talking about processing speed, pretty simply, it's just how long it takes you to get something done. And so here I have the pace at which someone takes in information, makes sense of it, and generates a response. And it's really related to executive function. And I'm assuming executive functions are a term that most of us who are on the call know. But um, it's always been prior to, to my starting to look at, and you know, other people too, starting to look at processing speed, what, what we really kind of thought of was, it was just another executive function skill. So, you know, and executive function skills are things like, and I think I have another slide here, they're the things that, that allow us to successfully use our intelligence and our problem solving abilities. So we can be very smart, but if we're really disorganized, we're really forgetful, we have really poor time management, it doesn't matter how smart we are, we're not going to get the stuff done. So we're not going to be able to use our intellect in a way that's really successful for us. Now, um, processing speed has just been thought of as another executive function skill. I really don't see it as that. So here are some different executive function skills like setting goals, planning, organizing, shifting set or shifting back and forth between one task and another being able to prioritize what should I do first, what should I do last, what can wait, what might not even need to be done, and then using working memory to remember what is it that I'm supposed to be doing at this one particular time, and then also monitoring what we're doing while we're doing it. So when a child is doing a math problem, to be able to know where am I in this problem, am I halfway through, am I all the way done, and so these are all really important skills that allow us, again, to use our intellect flexibly and and in a, in a way that's, that's you know, really efficacious. Processing speed, again, has always been thought of as one of those. I kind of think of processing speed as the engine that drives these executive function skills. So if you have, you can have great organizational skills, but if it takes you a really long time to kind of incorporate what's going on, that organizational skill is just not going to be as useful to you. So that's how I kind of think of it. it processing speed is, is sort of the engine that drives the car of executive function skills. Now, there are really three different kinds of processing speed, or at least three different kinds. 
And I'm just going to go over these quickly. And Leslie, in, in her um, description of Roman, actually hit on every one of these in one way or another. So one, one way that we process information is just visually. It's how quickly our eyes take in information and we'll lay it to our brain. At the very simplest level, it's how quickly our eyes dilate to light. Um, it may show up in different sorts of studies as people with slower visual processing may have more car accidents. They may have more difficulty, and these are older studies because we never look up phone numbers in a phone book, but studies that have been done on adults with processing speed difficulties. And I should say that a lot of my early writing about processing speed really looked at adults who were losing their ability to process information quickly because there's almost nothing on kids and how quickly they process information. What we found is that adults with slower processing speed have difficulties doing those sort of menial tasks in life that are kind of important. So for example, looking up a number, a phone number in a phone book. Now it might be trying to find that number on our phone or making change or finding something on a shelf. All of those things that make our life kind of easy for us. So imagine those sorts of things, and now we have data on this also, but imagine those little sorts of tasks that kids are asked to do all day, every day. Find your homework in your backpack, um, get your pencil out, remember to write this down from the phone, from the um, bulletin board. All of those are visual sorts of things. Now it's not just visual, it's oftentimes verbal as well. And so verbal processing is what you might think of it. It's how our ears take in information and then we'll lay it to our brain. It's also associated with more complex problem solving because our, our words and our verbal processing is really what makes us who we are as humans. So it really is very important to be able to process that. And I think Leslie talked about definitely that Roman doesn't have the language for that, that he has trouble sort of just describing what it is that he's doing, or just with auditory processing. And again, auditory processing was one of those things that used to be sort of synonymous with, you know, slow processing speed, but not everybody with auditory processing issues have slow processing speed and vice versa, but there's a big overlap between the two. So the kinds of problems that we'll see in kids who have slower verbal processing are things like not being able to quickly recall the words that they want at a particular time, or even just comprehending instructions, or sometimes they may look like a deer in the headlights when the teacher calls on them because they can't quite get those words all out and organized quickly enough. And then motor speed is the other type of processing speed. And we're talking about sort of these big categories. And that's really um, how quickly our brain sends a message to the body and tells the body, move, do this right quickly, you know. Um, and when we are kind of measuring that in our um, research lab or when we're trying to measure it in a child, it might be as simple as how quickly they're able to put pegs in a board or how quickly they're able to copy a series of numbers or even just read a paragraph. Now you see that all of these things, like reading a paragraph includes each one of these visual processing, verbal, and motor speed. Motor speed is you know, how quickly we talk. That's a motor act. Um, but I do find very often that when we assess kids, we find that they're, they're oftentimes having difficulties in one of these areas or two of these areas more specifically. And that's why getting a good evaluation can be very important. So it's complicated. When we're talking about visual, verbal, motor, we're really saying that you know kids may look really different depending on where their areas of weakness are. So they may look confused or absent-minded, seem to just do everything really slowly. They oftentimes might start out strong, but then kind of tune out. And that's sometimes within a math problem set or it's sometimes within a school year. I find that sometimes kids start really, really start the school year. They want everything to be just great. And by February, things are just sort of petering out. And so it, it can be, you know, they really have this drive, they have this desire that they want to really do better. And then they just, they can't manage it. It's not that they really tune out but it's that they can't do it. They're just a little bit behind here, here, here. And all of a sudden they find that they're way, way behind. They may also seem to forget information that they just learned, not necessarily because they forgot it, but because they can't always recall it at the time that they have to. 
some kids just avoid difficult or timed tasks altogether. They're like, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to refuse to do it. I would rather be a behavior problem than I would be thought of as slow. And sometimes they'll just leave things unfinished. And then in a small amount of kids, about 10% of the kids, I find that they rush through their work. They get to a certain point and, and usually not with a six-year-old like, like Roman, but sometimes with a 14, 15 or 16 year old, they'll rush through their work because again, it's better to just rush through and not get it right, but not be thought of as the last one and maybe not the smartest kid in the room. And the other thing, and again, Leslie, I, I hope I'm not putting you on, on the spot too much, but your, your, your synopsis was, was perfect, is that they have a hard time with social situations. And my, my research has really shown that social situations tend to be one of the biggest areas for kids with slower processing speed, not because they necessarily have a social skills deficit, but because social skills happen in a time frame, And we have to use all of that the, that verbal skills, the, the visual skills, we've got to be able to not just hear and interpret what somebody's saying, we've got to make sure we're looking at, are, did they roll their eyes? Did they wince their face? Are they joking? Are they not? So it affects kids' social skills more than we actually thought it did when we first started doing this research. So these are the sorts of things, again, that we might see in a, a child with problems with visual processing. We might see them um, ignoring important details, um, in proofreading their work, they don't want to do it, or they just have difficulty even doing it, especially in a time frame. They might be inattentive in their writing skills. They might struggle with those visual cues in social relationships, while I, like I was saying. And sometimes they might just stare into space, not because they're sort of inattentive, but I've had kids say to me that looking at somebody or looking at something is too much information. So some of the things that I've recommended in the past for kids, like look at somebody when they're, when they're talking to you or take in that information, doesn't always work for them because it's sort of like, I can't, you know, kids have said to me, I can't look and listen both at the same time. It's too much for me. So when we're talking about what to do, we've got to really talk to the child about what works for them and what doesn't. When we're talking about verbal processing, again, these are the sorts of behaviors that I hear most frequently. They don't listen, they can't follow instructions, they don't participate in class discussions because it's going by too quickly for them. They also might respond very slowly in conversations. It might even be things like, for example, going to a restaurant and having the waitress come up and say, what would you like? I mean, in the days when we used to go to restaurants, uh, a waitress coming up and saying, uh, well, you know, what, what would you like? And a child really having so, such trouble even coming up with you know, perusing the menu, looking over the menu, deciding what it is they want, um, that those are the sorts of things that make almost everything potentially troubling for a family. And then also as they, they might have trouble then staying engaged during social situations. So just to sort of um, say in, in some of those situations, like for example, the restaurant setting a child up in order to make sure that they, they have more success. So if you know you've got a child who takes forever to make a decision when they go into a restaurant to say, you know, there's, there's pizza on the menu and hamburger. Start, you know, when you're in the car, start making, start thinking about, do you want pizza? Do you want hamburgers? And, and think about that now, that that's sort of the, the kinds of coping skills that we think about. And then motor processing, what we oftentimes find are kids that just look really tired. Those are the things, that's the number one thing I hear from teachers, especially of younger kids, is I don't think he's getting a good enough night's sleep. And sometimes that's the case, but most often that's not the case. They might look what's called lazy or unmotivated, just move very slowly, don't want to get started on things because they know they're not going to get it done. They can do the assignment, but it's going to take them longer. And then the one thing that almost always kids with slower processing speed have difficulties with is in the aspect of writing. Because writing is usually done in a time frame. You know, it's not like people say, well, you know, here's your writing assignment, get to us, whenever, get it back to us whenever you want. It's, it's always in some sort of a time frame, either, you know, before class ends or by the end of the week, and that can be really tough. And then we see this trickle into all areas, really, of academic processing, from reading slowly, even if they don't have a reading disability, oftentimes they're slow at reading, they struggle to read out loud, have a hard time taking notes, writing things from the board, 
making errors when they're writing, expressing their ideas in writing, and even trouble kind of recalling basic math facts. And what this might mean is that it's a child who's very inconsistent in their academic performance. Now, I don't mean to say at all that kids with slower processing speed have all these difficulties. They don't. But they might have a difficulty here and one there. And depending how the lesson is taught, they may be at the top of their class. And then three days later, that same information is presented in a different way. And they, be, they might be look clueless as to what's going on. So what can you do? And there are a couple of things that, that can be done. One is to get a formal assessment. And that can either be done through the school system or outside of the school system. And if, if you guys are, are curious about that, I can talk about some of the pros and cons of that. You know, the biggest one is that through the school system, it's free. And it is, you know, at least in the United States, it's free. And um, what, what they won't do is come up with a diagnosis but they will give you some information about processing speed. Outside of the school system, privately, you usually get a more in-depth, personalized kind of assessment, but it's expensive and you often have to wait a long time for it. Another thing you can do though, is wait and see. And I always tell parents that, that you know, if you're gonna pursue that option and say, you know, I'm not ready for an evaluation yet, to, to be an active participant then in waiting and watching and seeing, asking the teachers what's going on and, and, and that sort of thing. So what can you do? And I, I, I've got a, something that I call the three A's of processing speed. So it's, it's acceptance, it's accommodating, and it's advocating. I wish so very much that I could say, we know exactly what, what cures this. There's a great, you know, I don't know, um, computer program that will fix this. There's a great medication, there isn't. And I have to be honest, it's, it's one of the, it's a million dollar question. It's the question that every parent asks, isn't there something that can be done? And there, there isn't yet, but there are lots of things that we can do. And the first thing that we can do is to accept our child for who he is and to learn about processing speed, to consider getting an evaluation and to value this difference in your child. Now that sounds very sort of like, oh, Pollyanna-ish, like, you know, well, but, but you can't do that all the time. I mean, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And you can't always say like, you know, when your child's not getting something done, well, I'm gonna value this in him right now. But you, but you can sort of at, at a bigger level say, this is who my child is. It's gonna take him longer. It's not always gonna take him longer. Someday he's gonna be an adult and he's probably gonna be a pretty thoughtful, pretty calm adult in some ways, because that is the sort of thing that I'm finding as, I'm, as we're, and, and we are um, watching these kids over time. We've got a longitudinal study going on it looks at, at sort of how the you know, kids with slower processing speed turn out. But I think that's one thing is to really accept this. This is it. And I've had parents say to me after an evaluation, so he's trying as hard as he can. This is as best as he can do. And I say, yes. And they, and they already say, well, if I know that's the case, then I can work with that. So that, that's one thing. And we shouldn't underestimate that. The other thing we can do is to accommodate their learning issues. And there are lots of things that we can do, like giving them extra time, smart use of technology. And I think, again, um, Leslie talked about how Roman sort of wants to fall back into that when he's feeling sort of overwhelmed. That's very common, too. So when I say technology, not just any technology, but the smart use of that. Also, um, teaching organizational skills or helping them organize their world in a way and time management, which I'll just talk about for, for a, a minute or two after this, because I think it's, it's another area of my research that I'm, I'm eager to share. But also the other thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes kids with slower processing speed have other issues as well. Learning disabilities, anxiety, ADHD, those are things we know how to treat. So we wanna make sure we're treating those things completely. We're maximizing anything we already know in order to be able to treat the child's other um, disabilities. And then we want to advocate. And again, Leslie talked about that. I need to, you know, she said, I need to give my child the words. I need the words to be able to know what to say. You want to be able to talk to their teacher. You want their, that eventually you want your child to be able to talk about himself too. So um, I'm just going to digress for just a second here because I oftentimes get asked about teachers and what we look for in a teacher. 
And here are some of the, the issues, and it sort of is applicable as well to families too, but these are the sorts of things that we have found that, be, that um, make a teacher particularly strong in helping kids with slower processing speed. So willing to learn about their unique learning lead, needs, able to change the tempo of an instruction. Um, busy work is a, just the kiss of death for kids with slower processing speed. It, it takes too long, it drags them down. And um, also teachers that are excited about technology and organized, but flexible. So generally teachers who are really inflexible, it's my way or the highway, do not work well with kids with slower processing speed, but also disorganized teachers don't either. And when we look at what kinds of schools are better or best for kids, schools that are neat and clean and uncluttered. Recess is very, very important for kids. And I think as we're thinking about kids who are at home, learning at home during COVID, we've got to be able to think about, are they moving enough? Are they getting out enough? Are they moving around during the day? And also flexible groupings of, of students, schools that sort of value each child for what they bring to a group and to a class really are helpful for kids with slower processing speed. Um, our research shows that in terms of home, the home situation, these common problem areas are the ones that are most reported by parents as being problematic. So problems with daily routines and chores, even problems trying new foods or situations. It's not something you generally think about when you think about processing speed, but it is when you think about you're at the dinner table and you put something new in front of your child, it's going to take them a little while to figure out what it is, you know, how they want to eat that or whether they want to try it. Well, by the time they decide it's okay, it's already cold, everybody else is finished. And then also transitions, impulse control, and time management. And having a lot of these problem areas can result in what we found a more negative relationship with caregivers. It makes perfect sense. So again, what can you do at home? Acknowledge the problem, minimize other family stressors. So one of the things we know in general that when there is stress in a family, it slows everyone down. And Leslie talked about this cycle of anxiety. So when Roman gets anxious, he slows down. And then when you slow down and you're behind everybody else, what happens is you get more anxious. You get more anxious, that slows you down. So this sort of pre, we find these kids are sort of predisposed to being anxious. So if you can keep that a lid on the anxiety as much as possible, it does help. And then also just educating yourself as you're doing tonight. I wanna to just, and I wanna make sure I have plenty of time for questions. So I'll go over this quickly. But one of the things we've been looking at is this idea of time, not time management, but time perception. And what we've found is a lot of kids with slower processing speed and ADHD as well have trouble understanding the concept of time, meaning that they don't really know what 10 minutes feels like versus 20 minutes. They don't really know oftentimes the months of the year. It can be in high, I've tested super bright kids in high school who don't know the months of the year. Um, they don't, because they don't use time as an organizing factor because it's not meaningful for them. And think about what we do with kids. What's the first thing we tell um, kids when they're disorganized? Get a calendar, put everything on the calendar, just organize your time. But they don't understand it. It's like ad asking somebody to color coordinate their wardrobe when they're colorblind. They can't literally do it. So our research has shown that this is a true disability. So one of the things that you can do at an early age is to help your child develop a sense of time. So by using clocks, I'm a big believer in teaching kids how to use an analog clock because you see time going by. You see what a quarter of an hour looks like. You, you, you integrate, it's multi-sensory when we use, a, a, use an analog clock or a watch. Using stopwatches, for example, saying to them, you know, today, let's time how long it takes you to take to brush your teeth. How long does it take for us to drive to school? Is it different in the morning or versus in the afternoon? It helps them then realize that, okay, that you said that was 15 minutes driving to school. This is what 15 minutes feels like. Because we ask them to um, guess how long it's going to take them to get something done, they usually underestimate how long it's going to take them. And they usually want more time. So for example, a child with slower processing speed, it might take the typical child 30 minutes to do something, a worksheet, let's just say. 
And I ask them how long it's going to take them. They're like, it'll be 20 minutes when really it's going to take them 45 minutes. So that's just something to think about. It's something that parents can do. The thing that's not helpful is yelling, screaming, or shouting. And it doesn't, it doesn't generally work, it doesn't work well. Um, also, referring to your child as lazy, even though it might feel that way, uh, I would encourage you not to use that word, but you, you, you can say it to yourself, even though you can say, well, it feels like laziness, even though I know that it's, it's brain-based. So very quickly, let me just tell you that for a lot of kids with processing speed, what we're talking about is a biological process. I'm not going to go into details about this now, but that it's either that there's something about the way the cells talk to one another, that maybe there's a, for some, in some brains, there's a bigger synaptic cleft, meaning that there's a, a bigger space here between neurons that make it, make a brain sort of take longer to process, or it can can be due to the, the um, myelin sheath that helps our brain um, be able to, to uh, work efficiently. So there, there are a number of different things that have been shown that may be uh, really important in how quickly we process information. For kids with strokes, it might be a different sort of process. And actually even for kids with a, a when we're talking about at the cell level, it's oftentimes a different different process, we really don't know. But oftentimes what happens with, in a child with a stroke is that the stroke happens in one area of the brain, which kind of slows everything else down. Now, I'm, I'm talking about this in a very gross kind of way, and Patty would be able to speak of this much, much better. And, um, but I don't wanna take time to talk about that now, but just know that what we're talking about is depending on where the stroke is, you might find areas of processing speed particularly weak. But that when uh, you know an area of the brain is um, you know in, in stressed or damaged in a certain way, it's going to slow down how well the rest of the brain functions. So let me stop right there and just say that we are doing a lot of research on this. A lot of things that we want to look at is, is how better to measure processing speed, how it relates to other brain-based issues. Um, we've, we've also done some research on something called sluggish cognitive tempo. I don't know if anybody's interested in that, but I can talk to, to you about that too. So a couple of things to remember, not all kids with slower processing speed have anxiety or emotional struggles or all the same things that Roman has. Um, they don't all have the same problems and they don't all look alike. Um, but I feel like in terms of the parents, I do feel like your concerns and your frustrations are very similar across the parents that I've worked with. So I will stop right there. As you can see, I talk very fast. So I sort of have faster processing speed. And I have a son who is very much like some of the, the kids that you're talking about. He um, just has slower processing speed and he will tell me, mom, because he's, he's learned those words to use. He said, you know, you really need to slow down and not tell me three things all at the same time because I have trouble comprehending those things quickly. So those are the sorts of things that we wanna make sure kids develop that kind of ability to do. So why don't I stop sharing my slides so that we are able to see more of each other and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to invite people to come on and ask questions. Uh, I'm actually first. So if you, you mentioned WISC and I just wish that you would explain, unpack that a little bit how or why would someone seek a neuropsychological investigation? Very good question. So I really, of course, this is my job, so I'm going to say this, but I think a neuropsychological evaluation or a school evaluation is the very first step in looking at whether or not a child has slower processing speed. And the WIX, the, the WISC that I um, mentioned is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. I would be happy to come back and talk just about the WISC and just how we measure processing speed and, and what you would look for in, in an evaluation. But um, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children has four different factors um, and now actually five different factors. And it's verbal comprehension. There are two areas that look at nonverbal problem solving. There's another one that looks at working memory. And there's another one that's actually called the processing speed index. So if your child has already had an evaluation, that's the one area you can look at. But really, any timed test is a test of processing speed. Any time we 
you say to somebody, do this, and I'm going to time you and see how long it takes, that's a test of processing speed. So, um, so in terms of getting an evaluation, you can ask for it through your school. If you have a neurologist, you can talk to your neurologist about making a referral for a private evaluation and talk to your pediatrician or again, your, neurolog your um, child's neurologist to, to get a better sense of whether or not an evaluation is something that should be pursued. I've never had a parent yet say, I wish we had waited longer to get an evaluation, but I've had many parents say to me, I wish we had done this sooner. So my feeling is if you, if you think an evaluation is something you've wondered, my, my um, recommendation would be to do it. And you can do it both through the school and privately. You know, it can take you a year to get a private evaluation. So ask the school for an evaluation and put your name on a waiting list for a neuropsychological evaluation that can be done in a year or so. I add a little piece of information for the parents in the call. Uh, for both in any country, if you ask the evaluation through the hospital system or the healthcare system that you're having your child being followed for the stroke, those neuropsychologists have access to where the lesion is. When you ask the evaluation through the school, they don't have access to the medical records. So you may want to get those records to them. They may not have the training to think through those particular anatomical defects. They do the evaluation very well, but they're not trained to look at organic, mm -hmm. uh, more biological problems. So there is value in both. Uh, and if there is an insurance put in a gate only one per year, I would say try to get the hospital base and the school will always complement that one uh, okay. if they need to test extra stuff. Because that one, the one at the hospital will bring to the school the knowledge of what happened to the brain of that kid that they can no access other way. The medical records don't talk to the school system. Yeah, that's such a, such a great point. And I think it brings up the issue of the, the purpose of a private evaluation, a hospital-based evaluation is to make a diagnosis and to bring the, you know, sort of um, pull the brain and the behavior together. So to, to really say, you know, like here's, here's what's happening when a child does this. And you're right that we um, hospital-based neuropsychologists are trained to look at how the brain impacts behavior. School-based evaluations, that is not the point of them. The, the point is to use the evaluation to determine what is important, what needs, what services need to be provided to make the child just adequately schooled. So the other thing that a, a private neuropsychologist will look at, or you know, hospital-based neuropsychologist will look at, we're not looking at what's adequate. We're looking at what's ideal. So that's another difference in our kinds of testing. You know, I, I'm going to say that, you know, like, yeah, this is a child with, with this kind of, of ability. In order to make them as great as they can be, we need to do this, where a school is, is going to be saying in order to adequately meet their needs. Nothing wrong with what the school is doing. That's that's their legal obligation, but it's they're they're different and they complement each other, like Patty said. I had an experience with this. I don't know if it's, uh, my son uh, had multiple strokes at the age of nine and this, he was on hospital homebound and the school uh, had a psych test, a neuropsych test on through the school district. It took me until la this past summer and he's now just 14 uh, to have one in the hospital based on what's going on in the brain and medically by a neuropsychologist. And I had been pushing to try to get some answers because when he had the first one in the school-based program. He, they didn't know him. I had to go back to where we'd moved from just to try to get information what he was like before. It was all, it was not the, well, anyway, it gave information, but it was limited. And there were so many changes in his personality and behavior. And I kept thinking, well, is this a normal thing? Does this happen to other kids that have had strokes? Does it, I had nowhere to go for information. So I kept pushing to try to see I said, I think there's something going on. I know that the first one showed that he was delayed. I know that he had processing delays because he would go about five beats later, he did hit it. And it was like, if you don't do this, don't go there. Boom, five beats later, he registered it. And it got better over time, but not I perfect. And when I just got the test results recently, um, I really think it's very valuable. It does take a long time depending on how you're going about it, certainly the medical ones, I had to wait almost four years, just after four years. And just to put the age there, three 
you should start requesting. You want early interventions to be followed by an early neuropsych evaluation at three and then school entrance and every two years if necessary. But that's what your legal rights are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at three, you can ask for it through the uh, hospital mm -hmm. and at six, that's what we do in our clinic. Not every clinic has the same resources and, and the possibility of accessing, but this is a right you should push for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely. I yeah. I'm just going to jump in for um, managing the Q&A. Some people are asking if we'll have the slides available, and we will. The recording of the talk and the slides will be available. We're, we're still working to get a website up to share these resources, but they will be shared. And just as a point of process, I'm going to call on people to ask the questions so that we can get through as many questions as possible. And when you're called on, if you're comfortable, please unmute yourself and ask. So the next question is from Christina in Western Mass. Hi, I'm just, bear with me, I'm trying to find it again in the chat. I don't see it. I know it was something about visual processing. There's too many K names, I, I don't see it. You asked what role visual processing plays in a child with a low vision diagnosis. Yes. So it, say it one more time, what um, neurovisual, um, to say it. What role does visual processing play in a child with a low vision diagnosis? So it does play a big role, but it's complicated. Because if a child has a visual issue, they're, they are going, you know, if, if you don't, if your vision isn't as good, uh, or if your visual system is, is impacted by a stroke, that automatically is going to slow down your visual processing ability. So that in, in some ways, I don't even think of as true um, visual processing deficit. That's a real visual deficit. And I think that one of the things you want to do is to determine how much of the visual deficit is, is um, causing the slower processing speed. And part of that is that's something that working with a neuropsychologist and also the ophthalmologist and the neurologist, that's a, a tricky thing to, to figure out, but it's very helpful when you do. You want to be able to say, this is the vision, vision problem that we can fix or, or remediate, and this is what's left. So oftentimes those two things go together if, you, if you've got um, problems in, in that system. I'm not sure I, I answered that question correctly, but. Just, I guess I was just wondering if there is like kind of a confirmed link you know, like, can you, obviously if you have a vision issue, it complicates a lot of things, but um, I've just been thinking a lot about this because vision wasn't our biggest challenge until remote learning. And now the vision and ADD seem to be much bigger issues than they were pre COVID. I mean, they were there, we knew they were there, but now it's kind of jumped to the top of the list where like some of the gross and fine motor skills aren't a challenge like they were before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's because what's happening in, in online learning is they're relying much more on their visual system than they are on the other sorts of things. So there's less of a writing requirement and more of that. So yes, yeah, some I saw somebody pop up in the chat. Perkins is a good resource for that. Definitely Perkins is, is a great resource. Um, and, but, but that's definitely, this is a great example of how sometimes what is, you know, maybe just, you know, a vision, issue or slower visual processing now has become a bigger issue because of the demands on the visual system. And also, again, remember I, I said that sometimes kids start out strong and then they sort of get weaker as time goes on. If you're you know, processing just a bit slower visually and you're relying on that all day for school, by the time four hours goes by, you're way behind the curve. You're way behind everybody else because you've been slowing that down. And I just saw somebody else said, yeah, that there's another uh, visual processor processing talk coming up, which I would um, definitely, you know. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So Angela, Scott, can you ask your question? My question was, um, can they have all three present at the same time? The three... Um deficits I guess and do they move between all three like 
can they change? Like maybe at breakfast today, it's a, a movement where another day it's a different deficit. Absolutely. And for a lot of kids, it is all three and all three are just as, you know, um, similarly impacted, but definitely. And, and then you might find it through an evaluation that one of these isn't as impacted as another. And then you want to make sure that you're doing as much as you can to rely on that area that isn't. But most definitely these things are tied. And even if they're not, like, let's say you even have a child who's got good like let's say auditory processing. And, um, but the, re the other two things that they're asked to do slows down the, the normal auditory processing. So even if, even if they're um, only one or two of those areas are impacted, the kinds of tasks they're asked to do, ask them to do, use all of them. So it might even look like they're weak in all of them. But yes, it, that's definitely the case. Rarely do we find a child who just is weak in just motor skills, for example. And Kara uh, Davies, can you ask your question? Yeah, hi, thanks for this. Um, I'm curious uh, about being able to tell the difference between dyslexia and, and visual processing. Um, I see some of the symptoms kind of overlap. So curious if there's a way to tell them apart and or if the my son did just have um, an evaluation. We don't have results back, but if that type of testing gets as detailed as splitting up, you know, those kinds of differences. Absolutely there is. So in dyslexia, what we find is the, the issue is really in phonological processing, meaning hearing the sounds that make up words and being able to match those sounds to the letters or the letter clusters that, that help us read. So, so um, dyslexia is really an auditory issue that relies on our visual system in order to be able to read. So it's not really a visual issue. It's really starts in the auditory um, area. So you're going to want to look in that evaluation as to whether or not there's a problem with just um, phonological processing, being able to sound out words, being able to spell words, being able to read fluently, for example. So these are two things that are very easily shown. What my research has shown is that a fair number of kids with dyslexia will also have slower processing speed. And so you can have both. In fact, it's fairly common to have both. In about 30 to 40% of the cases, kids with dyslexia will also have slow processing speed. It's important though, to be able to diagnose or get a, a, a good sense of both of those things. So you wanna make sure that, that, that reading and spelling is also very, and, and phonological awareness is also very well assessed. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna take one more question. Kristen from Salem, Mass. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, my question was just about the typical age when you start to see these challenges. I have a two-year-old who you may hear in the background. And um, I think the examples were, um, it seemed like the examples were largely like school age. Um, so I was just curious, you know, when you might start to see signs. A lot of parents say that they start to see it very early. And in fact, some parents even say, you know, this, my child with slower processing speed, like when I was pregnant with him or her, they seem to be much slower than my other kids. Like they just never seem to move. There was something about them, even as a baby, that seemed to be sort of slower at interpreting kind of what's going on in the world. So it's not too easy. And, and sometimes I, when I do talk, I, I can talk about these things in different ages. But a lot of times in younger kids, it's that they look kind of lethargic, sort of just slow to respond, um, not as interested in what's going on, sometimes slow to sort of like um, pick up on different words, even though their language is fine. They might use words a lot like thingy or that, that thing, thing, thingy thing, because they can't quite come up with the right word at the right time. So you might see sort of subtle issues with language processing, subtle issues, even in social skills. They're socially fine, but they might just not, you know, they might not uh, understand when they're at the playground that somebody's trying to play with them because they didn't respond to what they're doing in, in that sort of real time. So yes, you really can see some of these things at a very young age. And usually what a preschool teacher or kindergarten teacher will say is the child just seems sort of sluggish and tired. 
the number one thing that that teachers will say about young kids with what we found later on is to have slower processing speed. Thank you so much, Ellen. So I'd like to close off the questions now and what we'll offer is that we can answer them offline and put up a Q&A along with the recording. So you'll get your questions and answers at, at some future time. And I'll hand off to Patty Mussolino to close out the session for today. So first of all, thank you everybody for participating. And I, we always say that the knowledge is not in front of the room, it's in the room. And that's what I keep witnessing <laughs> is how much you guys have already understood of what's going on with your kids. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for putting the time. We know how busy you are and also for making things very practical. I, if I want everybody to remember something, is that slide that says, what do we do? <laughs> and you talk about watch and writing down and kind of starting creating their own experience of what time is. And that, remember when we had the workshop in person was also important when we were thinking about distance. A lot of our kids don't have a sense of perception of distance. That's caused sometimes by the stroke, most of the time by the stroke. And it's not minor. If you are starting empowering your child in learning the resources that they can use themselves to start kind of engaging on how do I measure this in myself? How do I prepare to answer a question? Maybe they will learn to ask for a little bit more time. They may, maybe they will understand that they want to do something. They have to take a little bit more time. And maybe they don't need to be talking or they look for the environment that allows them to function at the speed they can function. And I also love the title that Ellen, you use, Smart Kids. <laughs> okay, a lot of the potential of doing will get planted if we do not allow them to really process what's going on. And we are as family, as physicians, as caregivers and therapists and the teachers, the ones that we should try to adjust the environment as much as we can. So we favor that abilities that they have. So it sounded like a, a small thing, but I really, if you want to remember something on the, on the call is go back to the slide of what kind of things could you be doing in the day to day. And you have no idea the impact that will be for the kid to start having empowerment about their experience, about what is this processing speed on themselves. Um, and that would help you also to interface with, with the school and the teachers and, and family members. Uh, and maybe ask them, if they're gonna take the kids somewhere like just to start talking about these things and have them do these exercises with, with other people too. So they have a more fulfilling experience. I wanna close with um, a little bit of what we are ambitioning to do with this educational series. You guys know this comes out of what we used to do in person every six months uh, here at MGH. Uh, it's great that it's happening remotely. It gives a lot more access to many more families. We do want also questions on how do I do this in my system because I don't have these things that you guys are talking about. We are good at networking and we'll try to help you find your resources locally. And they are coming up every month. We are trying to keep this series going one hour and they're gonna switch in time and day so we don't make them um, not accessible to some people that may have conflicts on certain days. Are gonna be cortical visual processing which came up today and the Perkins group is gonna be working with people from Masai Anir that are in the ground trying to get these kids to navigate the world and school and the community. And then after that, we are working on auditory processing skill and what needs to come out of those evaluations. When can you do it? And before you can do it, how you can intervene on these possible difficulties. And then we'll talk about language <laughs> and how speech is getting developed. And we'll continue going um, with many more aspects. And we wanna hear from you guys. What is the unmet need? What are you struggling with? What you don't understand and what the clinicians or the therapists are talking about. That's what we are trying to do with this community. And we also ask and teach you for support. And support, it comes in different ways. Uh, it can come from donations, that's great. But what is most important is if you have a resource that works, if you have found a system that has helped your child, please share it with the community. We're trying to put these resources together as handouts, as website links, and we are unlinked from the hospital. The hospital does not allow private practice or anything that is private to be posted because of conflict of interest. And we don't want to promote anybody. And that's why we have a separate organization. So you guys can create that community. 
and there is no promotion of anybody if you if it worked to you it's what you're saying is your opinion and we'll try to also gouge things that are safe most important <laughs> to the kids so nobody gets entangled with a, a cost that may not be helpful or even harmful uh, so with that i think i don't know mara if i'm forgetting anything or any of the parents that work with us um and if you also want to work with the parent board and you have the time to invest or you have a skill set that you want to bring please let us know we are also working always looking for for hands-on uh people so with that i think we can say good night uh or good morning <laughs> or good middle of the day uh for those of you that were able to join today uh, and thank you so much for for your participation and for your interest thank you so much Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.